in the future, that joke is going to come back to bite me because I'm online giving advice. And at some point, someone's going to say, I thought you were a doctor. I said, a pizza. It was a joke. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. If you're into what we're doing here, you might also want to check out my personal branding and marketing tips called 59 Second Friday. That's over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. As many of you may know, we have never really had sponsors on Obsessed Show, but maybe the first sponsor could be you. We are now up on Patreon. If you head over to patreon.com slash Josh Miles and donate even a few bucks per episode, it would mean a lot. Thanks for checking that out. Again, that's patreon.com slash Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Okay, kids, today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with illustrator, speaker, and podcast host, Dr. Andy J. Pizza. Andy J. Pizza loves to give pep talks. He gets creative people jazzed on business and business people stoked on creativity. He's not an actual doctor, but understand he is open to receiving an honorary PhD in pizza. So if anybody wants to hook him up, you can let us know after the show. Apparently, Andy was right in my backyard. Okay, not not literally in my backyard, but in February of last year, he was in Indianapolis and I totally missed the opportunity to meet him. And besides that, he's only a few hours away from me in Ohio and he knows our friend Daniel Evans from episode 21. We'll link to that show in the show notes as well, just in case if you, you haven't caught that one yet. But we're gonna make up for the fact that Andy and I have never chatted before on today's episode. So without further ado, Doctor, welcome to Obsessed Show. It's so funny. I feel like, uh, you know, when I, when I don't know how the Dr. Andy J. Pizza thing came along, but I feel like in the future, that joke is going to come back to bite me because I'm online giving advice. And at some point, someone's going to say, I thought you were a doctor. I said, a pizza. It was just a joke. Like, please. I thought I could get away with it. But yeah, so no, not a doctor, but please do continue calling me that. I'm not a doctor, but I play one in pizza parlors. I play one in real life. That's right. That's right. That's right. So I'm excited to get my own personal pep talk today. Maybe yeah. that'll be a side thing. But that so which great. which came first for you? Was it the speaking thing or the illustration? Was it design? What what was kind of the, the kickoff? That's a phenomenal question. Uh, I had a, uh, I, you know, I feel like it gets tricky because you don't want to go into your salary, so to speak. But uh I had a you know middle class income, bought a house on illustration before I ever had the podcast or did any uh, you know real talks. So yeah. illustration was a a real thing for me, and I, you know before I had ever had a podcast, I'd were I had had published books and um, with Chronicle Books, and I had had agents, and I had worked with you know Sony and Starburst and Google and blah blah blah, all that you know all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think it's totally totally legit to have a podcast uh, before you make it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I just think if you're going to do that, I think it's a good move to shift the way that you think about it as cataloging your journey rather than uh, positioning yourself as an expert. And so, you know, by the time I'm not saying you know, I'm going to chafe at the word expert there, but I will say <laughs> that by the time I started a podcast, it was very much about sharing everything that I'd learned about mainly breaking into markets, creative markets, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of my, if I do have any expertise on creative careers, I think that's probably my number one, mainly because, um, in my career I've gone, I'm very antsy. I love new. And so that's kind of been a thing. I think of myself as like a, creative career market uh, heist expert of like how to break it. How do you break into this thing um, and be and strategically? So, you know, when I was wanted to do advertising illustration, I broke into that and, uh, you know, did work for clients like Google and Amazon, da, 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 all that crap. And then I wanted to do editorial and 
broke into that in a major way and worked with some great clients and then kids books and gig posters and podcasts and public speaking circuit, all that stuff. So, and I, I don't say any of that to, uh, I, uh, I started this totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> a huge rant of like, here's why I'm really important. It's not any of that. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to answer your question truthfully. <laughs> so that's all. And say that, you know, by the time I had a podcast, it was very much a thing of, I would like to share the things I've learned about building, building a creative career, which was a heck of a journey when it had a lot of ups and downs, especially at the beginning, a lot of downs, a lot of pain and a lot of um, having to learn the hard way and read business books and marketing books and listen to marketing podcasts all the way back to, you know, 2010 or whatever. Um, and, and even after, so I started my, I know this is long rant for that simple question, but um, <laughs> in 2014, uh, I, that's when I started the podcast. But even as far back as 2008, when I got my first big client, Sony, um, and I started all that year, I was getting different clients. As soon as I got my first one, I was, uh, I was living in England and I told my wife, like, I want to move back to the US and I want to just tell all my friends how I did this. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, that way, and that's uh, because I, you know, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about the word empath. I don't know. I don't, I'm, unco- I'm uncomfortable with it, but it does speak to my heart. So I don't know. But I, I am very empathetic. So there's something about watching any of my friends struggle uh, or, or having any success and other people not having it that mm-hmm. really uh, makes, moves me. I'm very passionate about being like, guys, I figured out how to get in there. I could tell you there's a secret door in the back and this you know, <laughs> the seven steps. And so, um, so yeah, that's where I was when I started the podcast. I was, uh, I'd gone through a bunch of struggle and I, and I wasn't, uh, I was not an illustration superstar, let's say, and I'm probably not even that now, but I was, I was pretty stable. You know, I I taught a class at the local art school and I was, uh, had a lot of client work. I was working evenings and weekends on agent agency, working illustration for agencies and doing all kinds of client stuff. Um, that's where I was when I started the podcast. Oh my gosh. How long was that? (laughs) (laughs) I think we're going to get about two or three questions in on this episode. All right. That was a great episode. It's an hour. All right, guys. If if you want to tell us where we can find you online, we'll make sure and link to that in the show notes. Um, No, I want to talk, take it a little bit further back though. Let's talk a little bit about... um, sort of behind the journey, much like you're not a doctor, I'm not actually a therapist, but this could feel a little bit like therapy at times. But hey, it's cheaper. Yeah, what you know? was, what's the the story behind the PEP? Or, you know, tell us about your design uh, origin story and how kind of the, the PEP element uh, worked into it. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, like I said, I am very empathetic and I don't mean that in a, sometimes actually just to, uh, self-deprecate a little bit because I'm getting too uh, proud of myself or something. You know, Indiana <laughs> boys, we're not comfortable with that. I'm sure. Yeah, knock yourself down a couple notches there, doctor. I gotta knock myself down. You know, sometimes I'm so I can feel people's pain so much that I block other people out, and I, you know, I have a hard time reading the news, and I, I will try to just hide in my own little happy place. So you know, that empathy is sometimes a curse, and I. Uh, actually makes me a bad person in some ways. So it's, you know, I'm not saying it, that's just a natural thing for me. Um, and so, okay. So when I was growing up, uh, I, I've, I was, I've always had ADHD obviously, and I've always been a weirdo. And like in kindergarten, if you're the weird kid, uh, who can make the weirdest face and draw the coolest picture, you are the star pupil and <laughs> cool is if you're on the top at that point, it's just, downhill in the worst kind of way from there on out. Like you just go down. You peaked the just a little too early. <laughs> really early. And everything, uh, everything that they value, like each year, the things that I was a star at just started getting taken out. So like show and tell really good at that. They cut that like second grade recess, fifth grade art class goes down to like one afternoon a week. Uh, like everything I was good at just got, by the time I was in high school, I was just, um, I, I was very a non-person. I didn't have a group. 
I really wanted to be cool. I really wanted to be popular. And the popular people kind of entertained me, but they didn't actually like me. Um, and uh, it was just, I didn't know who I was. And, and I, was, I was doing okay at school, but I hated it. Uh, and I didn't play sports. And I was terrible at my part-time job. I would lose tons of money. I worked at a movie theater. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th that's kind of where I was. And I was watching all of my... Uh, all of my friends, my creative friends graduate and just like really struggle and just like it, you know, and, uh, and I, and not only that, when I was really little, uh, I was, I worshiped my mom. I was just like crazy about her. I just thought she was the coolest person in the world. She's not diagnosed, but I'm 99.9999% sure that she has ADHD. Um, it runs, it's a thing that it is a genetic thing. And, uh, she, when I was really little, she was super creative, but she, she, I never lived with her. So, and, uh, after I was one, she left me and my brother. So, um, and she kind of, when I was little, she would just like do these awesome things like draw Wolverine on my X-Men card collection binder. Mm -hmm. And I was just all with a Sharpie and it was amazing. And I would show all my friends, I just thought this, who is this mom? She's the coolest mom. And she was like, uh, you know, making kids book pitches and just like doing this super cool stuff. And she was a goofball. And I just thought, man, she's the most amazing person in the world. And uh, people, all of my relatives would be like, you are just like Susie. You're the same. You guys are the same. And I was like, that's amazing. Cause she's the coolest person I know. Um, and then as I got older, her life kind of like turned out to be really tragic. So she left my family and then she started a new family, left another family uh, she could never keep a job. Mm -hmm. she, you know, she was in mild drugs early on, but then got into really hardcore drugs. Ended up having this like, uh, and I've talked about this a ton, so I'm very comfortable in case you're not comfortable <laughs> talking about this. But, uh, um, but anyway, she, she got into hardcore drugs, ended up in the hospital. And long story short, uh, that, all those words from when I was a kid of you're just like her mm -hmm. went from blessing to this like, uh, like a prophecy of doom over my life of like, yeah. this is what the world does to people like you. And this, this is your path. Get, get ready, buckle up. And so when I was in high school, I was just like, I can't see a path that leads to anywhere I want to go, which is a dark spot for a high school student for anybody, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I think you're susceptible with all the hormones going crazy. And just, <laughs> just like, it was just a dark spot. And it, and at that time, uh, my friend, Will Johnston, who's not famous, but I just, he's one of those full name guys. Um, he came in a Spanish class and he put Modest Mouse on the jukebox or on the, on the jukebox. Wouldn't that be awesome if we had a jukebox <laughs> on the boom box before, uh, before class. And I'd been, you know, only listening to like Maroon 5 and Boys to Men and not that there's anything wrong with these things, but Mo Modest Mouse was just this, such a quirkier more abstract, weird, creative take on mm -hmm. music that I'd never heard. I didn't know anything about the independent music scene or the alternative music scene, really. Um, and I was just, and I didn't like it the first time I heard it. I was just like, I, it made me uncomfortable. I was like, what? This is weird. But I was so, it made me curious. And so I went and bought it and I listened to it a million times and then it clicked and I became obsessed. And then I saw their band merch. And, I, and so in the music, I was like, oh, I feel very understood. But the band merch, I was like, these are my people. Like I could be that. I know I could mm. make posters like that. I couldn't make yeah. them right now, but I know that I know it was the first time where I saw an example of myself in the future of someone thriving. And I thought that was the yellow brick road moment of like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So that that kind of explains both the pep side and the illustration side and the and the creative side, because um, the pep comes from, you know, going through all the pain, knowing that this world isn't necessarily super conducive to creative people thriving and watching the, the fallout of my mom kind of leading a tragic life and how that not just affects me, now it affects my kids, now it affects my wife, the, the ripples of somebody missing their purpose or, you know, uh, not, I don't know, you know, it's, I, it's hard to find words for it, but kind of making tragic decisions or, or, destructive decisions it seems like it just affects you but it ends up having this ripple effect and so 
you know, everything I learned about, oh, wait, I am not, I'm like this breakthrough in this illustration career meant that I didn't end up as a piece of trash. And, uh, you know, all the other people like me, I can tell them the things that work for me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, you know, for for those of our listeners who maybe have not yet listened to the Creative Pep Talk podcast, um, as I listen to it, I definitely pick up on the empathy. And I also, I didn't know why, but now I understand there is your voice on that podcast has like a sense of urgency to it. It's like, guys, don't miss this. Do this right now. You've got, just go, go hit it, go hammer this home. And, and it makes sense now it all, it all comes together. Yeah. Yeah. There's a definite uh, urgency to it. I think about all the time how now look, I, The other thing that I try to do on the show, which is kind of impossible, is always present a non-dual way of thinking. So, you know, what I'm about to say, there's this Niels Bohr quote that I heard from Frank uh, Camaro, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, very smart guy. I'd like to meet him one day. But uh, he, um, I always reference where I heard the quote because I'm not smart enough to be reading Niels Bohr. I don't know. I don't even know who he is. I just know this quote and I love it. And it's the opposite. Physicist or something, right? What's that? He was like a nuclear physicist or I think that's correct. Something. I think that's I don't know. I believe listeners, you're, you're probably right. smarter than we are, but yes. Just, please correct us on Twitter. Yes, I'm sure please you're gonna do, do it anyway. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, we love you, Twitter people. But Um, This will be the first time Niels Bohr shows up in the show notes to obsessed (laughs) show, by the way. (laughs) Yes. I'm stealing that from Frank. Um, the, it's the, uh, the quote is the opposite of a profound truth might be another profound truth. Like that's the esoteric nature Mm. of truth. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you get to the big picture, things are not black and white. It's a non-dual way of thinking. So you can, it's a both and way of thinking. So, you know, one of the, so what I'm about to say, I preface it with that because um, the opposite of it is powerful too. But I still believe that in your body is the strongest, most complex tool in the known universe. That's not even a, that's not just an inspirational Instagram post. That's, act, that's actually true. We literally can't find anything more powerful than the thing that's in here, right? Yeah. So to me, it's kind of like, that's just like the greatest gift. But if you don't break it open, then it becomes uh, uh, the greatest curse or the greatest tragedy of like to leave mm-hmm. this thing and just use it as a, a coat closet for old information instead of its creative potential. You're literally sitting on the greatest resource in the universe. Right. And, uh, well, you're not literally sitting on it unless you're in <laughs> head, which is a weird. Which story. is a talent in and of itself. Hey, and maybe you're doing that. That's very creative. So <laughs> that, maybe you're not wasting it. But that's kind of that's the urgency thing of I'm very in tune with the shot clock of life. And uh, you know, I'm reading this Jim Henson uh, bio right now, and he had it early on in his life, his uh, brother passed away uh, at, uh, when they were like early 20s. And he was already doing a bunch of interesting things and had, was on like public TV and, uh, or local TV um, and had, had some breakthroughs. But everybody around him said that when that happened, when his brother died, he like lit a fuse and he like all mm-hmm. of a sudden shot clock of like, I've got to be. And I don't, want, I don't want the opposite of all that is. I'm not saying that means. Anyway, I'm going to let you ask another question. <laughs> I, don't know why I'm so, I'm, I told you I went on a jog. My brain's firing on all cylinders. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he, like, there's this, uh, I don't know if I heard this somewhere or what, but there's this idea. I think I always thought I need to do the most I can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then what I realized, what I actually need to do is the best I can do, which is not synonymous with the most, that the best I can do is me well-rested, me uh, filled to the brim, me happy, me, you know, all, all very, a whole person. That's actually the best that I can do. And so that, that urgency can sometimes sound like I'm just one of those motivational guys who's like, hustle, man, you got to work all night. I'm not saying any of that. I'm yeah. just saying that don't wait around to, to get started on all that. And the jury's still out on the jogging thing, whether that's actually, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We'll see how the rest of this podcast goes. Yeah. 
I came in uh, to my house and my face was like uh, bright red from the sun. And my wife was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I feel fantastic. But why? <laughs> oh, no reason. Yeah. Why do you, why do you ask? So drastic shift in gears. You talked a little bit about the podcast a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I was listening to you somewhere telling the story about how Apple was into the art that you did for your own podcast. And yeah, that's true. that was one of the reasons why you believe it kind of got, got pushed and a lot of listeners joined. And can you tell us a little bit more about how that whole thing came to be? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, I think that's one component of the podcast growth early on. Uh, like I know that it was recognized on iTunes by people at Apple because of the, uh, ep- the podcast art. Um, and they had me, I, I know that they had featured it in like, um, uh, like a what's new or what the new and noteworthy or whatever they call yeah, it. That yeah. Kind of thing in, in, in one of the, either the sections or I don't know. Um, but on iTunes early days. And then also they reached out to have me sign something that said they could use the artwork in their, uh, campaigns. So they ended up using it. At le- I think they use it in a few different places. I know they used it on their Twitter to promote a new mm. podcast feature. They used my artwork on there. Um, and you know, the interesting thing about that, the only reason I brought it up on the podcast was because, uh, it marked a real shift in the way, in my self-worth and the way that I thought about, uh, my illustration. Uh, and I realized that if I was able to, if my, you know, my, uh, I have a friend, Meg Lewis. Do you know her? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she's awesome. She, she, she says this thing about how one of the best ways to kind of get in touch with your purpose and, and who you are is to first think about what you're self-conscious about. Because if you think about what you're self-conscious about, because you already know that because it's something that's, <laughs> you know, ringing in your ears all the time. Uh, that usually you're self-conscious about something that's different about you because whatever's different about you, that's what people notice and that's what people comment on. Now we're, we don't log away the things that people comment on that are positive very much, but we do log away all of the things that we perceive as a diss. And so mm-hmm. if you start in that place of like, what, you know, what thing is like, and so early on, I promise I'm going to get back to the podcast art it all. It'll circle back. Um, early on in my career, I remember, uh, one of the art directors that would hire me for a few jobs, we went out for drinks and uh, this is like in Manchester, England. Uh, uh, and he, he said something about how he's like, yeah, if I want something loud with like no white space and just covered a thing with, with <laughs> then I'll hire you. That's why I go to you. <laughs> And I thought, man, that's definitely a diss of like saying my stuff's not so sophisticated and it's not subtle. And so, you know, I always kind of took that as this uh, weakness when in fact, if you flip it on its head, it can be a strength. So not mm-hmm. being subtle, the opposite of that is loud. It's really loud. Guess who likes that? Advertising clients. They want loud. One of the reason they're hiring you, the value that they're seeking, especially if they're commissioning stuff online, is getting people's attention. And so when I realized that through the thousands and thousands of podcasts, that my illustration actually had very clear monetary value for me, and I realized how important that would be for clients, it made me instantly hire my rates because I was like, I, not only is it worth something, but I can use the power of my illustration for my own businesses and get the full payout. So if you're not willing to pay me in a you know, value-based pricing sort of way, then I'm not going to sell my illustration to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I, I think that relates to so many things, even for our, our end clients, is that the more and more niche or niche, if you must, with your pinky out, yeah. um, the more, if you're, England, if you're holding a beverage, oh, okay. pinky's out for niche. Well, I've got a nice little coffee. Here. <laughs> there you yeah. You can totally very pull it niche up. Podcast. Very, very niche. But mm. the, the more you can dial in that audience very specifically, the more you can charge because that's, that's exactly who needs your thing that only you can do. So. I think that's a great encouragement. Not only that, you know, I think about uh, this all the time, you know, first of all, when my podcast was very niche, very niche down to the uh, illustration crowd, um, you know, the first year and a half, uh, although the numbers weren't huge, I had a megaphone to that community. And so there were clients that 
want to sell to illustration or want to, uh, want to, yeah, I want to sell to illustrators that would sponsor my podcast, even though it wasn't a big enough podcast to get other kinds of sponsors. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of value in uh, niching down. And not only that, I think it's interesting if you go into the diffusion of innovation, how ideas spread, um, you know, this, I like to mix the concepts of Kevin Kelly with the thousand true fans mm -hmm. with diffusion of innovation of like, um, Kevin Kelly is kind of selling. Are you familiar with Thousand True Fans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing your audience is probably pretty uh, privy to that concept, which is just basically if you have a thousand true fans, and you set you, and if they're true fans, they'll buy a hundred dollars worth of stuff from you every year. That's a hundred thousand dollars. Nobody's too good for that as a as a base salary or as a, as a salary. Um, anyway, what I was going to say was uh, Kevin Kelly sells that as the end. When mm -hmm. you plug that into the diffusion of innovation, it's actually the means of how to spread something. So, you know, uh, being an innovator and having a really tight, crazy, passionate group of early adopters, uh, that's not the end of a process. If you're niching down and really connecting with those people, that's the birth of a movement. Right. Absolutely. You know? So anyway, I'm just riffing on stuff. Told you, tangents. Man, I, I love it. I think that's uh, I mean, to your point. When you do have a thousand, whatever, you've got a thousand people who are part of your thing. That's so when that movement's get ready to blow up. You know, yes. twenty twenty Out true fans. My mom and her best friend and her neighbor. You know, that that's not <laughs> enough. That yeah, that's enough hey. to maybe feel good. It depends you know. who your mom is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean, if you're Michelle Obama's kids. You're fine. <laughs> that's right. That's all you need. She comes with her own thousand true fans, I think. That's true. Maybe yeah. a few, maybe a few Probably. more. Probably. <laughs> <So>, yeah. <laughs> so wasn't your, your first book, right? But the, the podcast birthed its own little baby book. Tell us a little yeah. bit about the pitch us uh, about the book itself. To the creative pep talk book that I did with Chronicle or the yeah. one that I published. Uh, okay. So the Chron yeah. Chronicle book. Um, yeah. So weirdly enough, uh, we published that book in 2017. It's an anthology of create, creative wisdom lettered by various illustrators and designers. And, uh, and it, it also comes with an explanation of that lettering from the different 50 artists that are in the book. And, you know, I think that I really love that book. I like it mainly because I think it's a good resource for kind of opening randomly and just getting the synchronicity of the day. Mm -hmm. um, I love stuff like that. I'm kind of a sucker for anything like that. So that's what I like about the book. You can just kind of open it and see what hits you that day. And, and maybe it's relevant to you in a universal cosmic way, maybe not. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting about that book is that, that, you know, the story as it, as it's seen, the obvious story from that book is not actually true. So that book did not come from the podcast. And I actually, had I sold that book uh, after I had the podcast, I would have made it a totally different book. So that, that book was sold the spring before I had started the podcast. Oh, interesting. And, I had, and the interesting thing about that is, because uh, I'd worked with Chronicle on several other projects, and, and I'd pitched him a bunch of books. And um, that... The interesting thing about that to me is I'm really interested in this idea of what I call the coffee and the cup. So the coffee is the essence. That's like the stuff that matters the most. It's the creative stuff. It's the juicy bit. It's the, all the uh, killer, not filler stuff, you know. Um, it's the stuff as creatives that we think, we know this is the secret sauce. This is the important, the creativity, right? Whatever the, whatever the thing that moves the needle on the creative stuff and uh, the cup is like the container that you put the coffee in, which everyone knows what a cup is. Um, but, uh, but <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cup. Um, the cup is like the packaging, the marketing, the brain. That's also a form of a cup, also known as a travel mug. It's just uh, taller. You can get them for seventeen ninety nine right now. We're taking. <laughs> All. Um, $17.99. That's 18 easy payments of $17.99. So I should say that. Um, because we're <laughs> picking a niche audience to sell this travel mug too. So now it's <laughs> 12 right. times more. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Congratulations. Uh, that's, that's funny. Um, so here's what I was saying. The, 
Um, the mug is like the cover of the book, right? So the, the, the good stuff, the important stuff, it's in the pages of the book, but to get people to engage with it, you got to go, you got to have the right book cover because, and I always say, we should get rid of that quote that says, don't judge a book by its cover. The quote should be, remember, people judge books by their covers. So like, <laughs> you know, make a cover, make, you know, make sure you're communicating what you want to be communicating with your book covers and also with your names. And that's why I'm bringing all this up is I ha- the creative pep talk phrase. I knew it was a good cover when I came up with it. And when I can, uh, that title was actually a section to a blog that I had a years before that. And I, you know, I had a blog and it was called Art Directions, which was okay. It was, you know, it didn't, it, nobody hated it, but it wasn't selling anything. And I had to, um, I started doing these interviews on the blog and I created a section called, uh, I just, I remember I was like on my Tumblr and I was like uh, trying to figure, what am I going to call this section? I thought, I came up with Creative Pep Talk and I thought, oh, I was like, ah, I, I'll call this column that, but I know that feels like something. And yeah. Then, yeah. And actually, I think like I sold that book and I feel like just similar to the podcast art, similar to the, the book, I feel like a, a slice of wherever that podcast has gone has something to do with the title. Like it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a good title. And I'm not, I'm only bragging because I get one of those every, once every eight years or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that makes it sense. Was, it was the tail that wagged the blog. That's it. That's that's good. Are you a dad? <laughs> I am. I knew it. That's a dad sticking little, together. Little with... dad joke. Little dad joke <laughs> problem here. Yeah. I love it. That was good. That's funny. Oh, the, I, the, what was it? I, I the, the, <laughs> you said the the, the, the the tail that wags the, the blog. Tail that wags the blog. That's it. You're not wrong. And it and it wagged the book, and it then it wagged the podcast. So yes. So another another major shift before we get completely mired in puns. Um, yeah. I know once you get started, it's that's right. It's, they get out of control. It's an addiction. It's like it's like uh, potato chips. Um, I agree. So a few of our listeners may have heard of a few of your clients: New York Times, Nickelodeon, Amazon, YouTube, Google, Warby Parker, Fast Company, Nutella, Airbnb. The list goes on. Guys, you can check out. Dr. Pizza's website as well, if you're curious. But what what I want to know is, it's easy to look at this client list and go, well, these are obviously amazing companies. But amazing companies don't always feel like amazing clients. So I'm curious for you, outside of the big names, like how do you define what makes a great client for you? It's a really good question. And actually, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that it's always changing. So what was a great client? uh, you know, five years ago, doesn't feel the same to me now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what you value is always shifting. So, uh, but I do think that, uh, what was always a great client was that they are, they are hiring me for what I believe to be my true value. Uh, that's a big deal. You know, there's a lot of times where, they're hiring you for reasons that you don't really care about, you know, for some reason they think you're the hot illustrator right now, or that, which I don't think that's ever been the case for me, but, <laughs> but for some, you know, some, or they just value something that is not important to me that, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not interested in doing it. It doesn't really do it for me. Um, and I think that the clients that I think it's, I think a lot about the parallels between acting and illustration and design and, uh, and how, you know, getting a client is a lot like getting a role and Mm -hmm. you're auditioning. And, uh, and, and I think, I think a lot about casting directors and the ones that are really good at it. And then the ones that phone it in and, you know, a casting director, their job is, it's not, it's very similar to an art director and they're, yeah, they are supposed to be casting you based on what we what they know you're good at. And I think that that's great, but that's kind of like typecasting. Uh, the best case scenario for a client for me is what I think Allison Jones does. Do you know Allison Jones? No. You heard of her? She's a legend. I want to have her on my podcast. I, I'm putting that into the universe. Uh, Allison Jones... 
I don't, I might get some of these shows wrong, but I'm, I'm, I know some of them for sure. So she cast the office parks and rec. Uh, I think Brooklyn nine, nine, she cast, uh, just, I mean, Oh, she cast uh, freaks and geeks. She found all those people. She, mm. she is a freaking legend, right? Best in, best casting director of all time, in my opinion. And the thing that I love about Alison Jones is she looks for things in people that they don't know they have and, and looks for things in people that no one else sees. And that, that's the real gift of an art director or right. a casting director is they're like your fairy godmother that shows up and says, you know what? You're a princess. No one's ever said, <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever said that to me. Yeah. If I you had a nickel for every time somebody had told you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're supposed to show up and see something in you that is of real value. And it's amazing when they see some, like for instance, uh, when I did the, one of my favorite jobs ever was the Warby Parker store that I did um, in Columbus, Ohio. I just want to put a little uh, disclaimer here, okay? All the Warby Parker stores are illustrators and designers who, every store is different. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the kind of similar movement because the art director has a, a particular taste. Yeah. And uh, it's funny that my, I hope my mom never <laughs> Yes. But my mom uh, went into one of them that was not mine and just assumed that it was and then took photos of it and then put it on Facebook and was like, look, at, I'm so proud of my son. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> mine. And, I, you know, I get it. I think when you're in the movement, you're in illustration, you see the nuance of everybody's work. All right. Um, but, you know, I think that from, an, from the outside, like people can look at like, adventure time and think that looks mm -hmm. like work. And to me i think how could you possibly think that that's insane um like don't you i don't do noses like that what like <laughs> there couldn't be a bit more different um but um anyway when i did the warby parker job that art director he's phenomenal and he had seen a piece that i'd done uh for my podcast that was mm -hmm. one of my favorite pieces that i'd ever made and i you know, it was a very intuitive piece. There wasn't like, I really, really love doing conceptual stuff. I like stuff where writing and illustration is like, in just, you know, uh, completely connected in ways that you can't extract. Like the, I like that authorship, but this is a, a piece that is very intuitive. It's just, there's nothing super conceptual about it. It's pure taste for me. She's like, this fits like, oh, I like, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it was a poster I did. Um, that says reach for the stars. And he saw that. And in that he saw like an update on old arcade game graphics. And that was the inspiration of the store. And we'd actually explored even going further down that road. That didn't end up happening, but we did. We, that was kind of the vibe of the whole store. And we took this poster as inspiration that I'd made and we built out that and we did all these, we did six enamel pens and we did four big canvases that were printed. And, and we did a bunch of signage on the outside of the, uh, outside of the store. If you're ever in Columbus, Ohio on high street, short North, go check it out. That's, I'm probably, that's probably my, as far as client work goes, that's probably the project that I'm most proud of. And I think what was amazing about that was it was an Allison Jones moment of like, he mm -hmm. saw this piece and he saw like, this could be extracted to, you know, completely transform a store and be this immersive experience. And also saw the kind of Pac-Man Galaga uh, thing going on. And yeah, it was just, that's, that was so rewarding. So one of the things that you've kind of touched on a little bit was um, one thing you said was, you know, clients that might've been a good fit a couple of years ago, or kind of explored style a little bit. I understand that you kind of made a style shift here recently. What was, what was that about or what kind of drove that? Yeah. So, uh, I want to just say that if anybody from Apple is listening, I'm still taking on advertising work. Like <laughs> that's one of the fish that I have yet to catch. I would love, I'd love to work for Apple. Um, how many times am I going to say that? <laughs> app, I would, I'd love to work for Apple. Apple, 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 Apple. Um, Just put that in the keywords if you could. Uh, <laughs> um, 
No, I, I, st- I still am doing client work, work that's good fit, stuff like that, Warby Parker stuff. I'm, I'm doing that. They don't even have to be big clients, but it is about fit. And, and it's also about schedule. But um, so I'm still doing that stuff that's more vector based. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, uh, you know, more digital work. Um, but about, about a year ago now, I made a pretty significant shift to make most of the stuff that I'm making for myself and the stuff that I'm trying to push into next is starts in paint and it all starts not MS paint. <laughs> that'd be Man. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I was really actually, excited to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going way old school on retro graphics. Um, now it goes all the way. You know, I start with everything with gouache paint and it ends up in the computer. It does have digital finish to it usually. Um, but, and I make it in layers and I'm scanning in several things. And the reason why is because I wanted to move into uh, the majority of stuff I'm doing, at least starting in self-authorship. And that, now my, that means that the client relationships that I'm doing, I want that to be, it, yeah. so like I'm comfortable, I'm very actually enthusiastic about influencer campaigns mm-hmm. and I go down that road if we want to, but what I like about influencer campaigns is the brand is like, we don't know how to connect with this audience. Will you teach us how? So they want me to be, they want me to be self-authored. They want me to mm-hmm. come up with the, the copy and the ideas and everything, and the illustration and all of it. Uh, and so that on the client side, that's the B2B business to business stuff. But mostly what I want to do is uh, next is business to customer stuff, which is books and, and, and my podcast and um, you know, public speaking that's slightly a show as well and and the reason I switched to paint is because it's messier and if you've listened to this episode alone you know I'm a messy person I'm a messy person I make mistakes I'm all over the place but it's you know it's all I've got it's what it, if there's anything good about the stuff that I've got it has it's very tangled in the chaos and so the that's the it's thing it's very about, pizza it's, it's all <laughs> Yeah, it's like a sloppy pizza. It's like Giordano's. <laughs> That's a, they, you should get some sponsorship. Right. Exactly. Uh, I love I love Giordano's. I you know Giordano's? I do. Yeah. I eat it one time a year on my birthday, July twentieth. It's coming up. I'm gonna order Giordano's. It's gonna be fattening and delicious. Um. <laughs> but anyway, the, the paint stuff. It came from over the past couple of years. I was. Uh, I, I was un, so all of the episode art, I make an, I make artwork for each episode. And before about a year ago, everything I was making, the strategy behind it was, it was kind of serving two masters. So it was like podcast art, but it's mostly a menu for potential advertising clients. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, it's a, you know, it was a very strategic move and started to get like aggravated by it not serving the purpose that it needed to for the podcast primarily. So like I knew I could make stuff that felt more like the podcast and was better artwork at promoting the episode and better working on Instagram for my actual audience. And not only that, I started making pitches for books around creative pep talk, other, other books in that vein. And they were self-authored and they were going to be fully illustrated and everything I would make in that digital style did not feel like the podcast. And it was driving me nuts. I'd made, I've made so many book pitches. You don't even want to know. Like I've written full books like plenty of times. And every time I would make this artwork, I was just like, it doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like the show. Yeah. It doesn't feel like me talking. And, uh, and so I just explored for the past couple of years, I've been exploring that. And then I kind of hit a breaking point about, about a year ago. I started, uh, it started to come together and this analog stuff that's mixed with the digital, uh, it just started working and that that is me risking uh, a shift to part of my business in stuff that works a lot more for books, a lot more for promoting the show, a lot more for Instagram, giving priority to the next season to that stuff and uh, and editorial too. I, th- I still think it, it, it just, that stuff's not going to be on a billboard because you can't scale it. So, yeah. So, um, one of the things that I was curious about is I know a lot of illustrators 
work with reps and some illustrators kind of go it alone. Um, what's your approach been and yeah, what so works best for you? I've had uh, a few different reps over the past uh, decade, a little over a decade. I've had probably four or five reps for different reasons. They weren't all doing the same thing. Uh, right now, uh, my agent is uh, Ryan Appleton and, uh, and I also have book agents. Um, but it took me a long, to, a long time to get to this particular place where I'm really genuinely stoked about my relationship to the agent. Hmm. And I think the reason why is because I think our, our industries have dramatically changed over the past 15 years. I mean, that's not news to anybody. Like everybody knows that the internet it changed everything. And it used to be obviously that like, if you were an illustrator and you wanted to get jobs, you pretty much had to rely on an agent to go sell your work and, and they had the connections and it was kind of the only way to do it, only way to survive. And I think nowadays, uh, the purpose of an agent has very little do, to do with acquiring new work. Like I think, the I think you're way better equipped to acquire work on your own and and have your own marketing plan and your own personal projects and, and and go that alone because I think it comes from your voice and I think just the way that everything's worked out I think that's the main function it's not the main function of agents anymore so I I I always recommend you know get the engine going get it to where you can't handle the negotiations anymore. You can't handle the workload. You need someone to help you manage the project. You need someone to help you negotiate. You need some, you know, they become kind of an extension of your business, you know? Uh, and I think for me, it's like, I don't need a full-time person working with me at this stage, but I could use another member of my team working mm -hmm. in areas that I'm not, I'm not very good at anyway. And so, at this stage, I'm in a place where I'm super happy to have that. But early on, there wasn't really any good, all of my agents weren't really, they weren't, you know, they were taking a cut, but it was not, it wasn't serving a purpose because it was, the, the value they were providing were things I could have done because I could manage the amount of projects that were coming in and the deals I was doing were small enough where it just wasn't worthwhile. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So maybe um, give us a rundown. I'm sure it varies greatly, but sort of generalize for us how you how you spend your your week. You know, how much of your time is administrative versus illustration versus time you commit to the podcast, and how frequently you publish and all that good stuff. Yeah. So uh, that changes. That's that changes every year. Uh, and that's by design because I, like I said, I'm ADHD and I get bored and I like, I like everything changing all the time and I like uh, spending my energy in different ways. Uh, so, but right now it looks like I'm probably working probably two days on the podcast a week. Um, and that's pretty new. That probably only has been true for about a year. Um, before that, I was probably spending an afternoon or like a, maybe, maybe a full day a mm -hmm. week. Now I'm probably spending more time focused on that. Uh, I'm spending, I'm not doing that administ that much administration stuff. I'm doing a lot less than I've ever done, mostly thanks to my agent. Um, he helps me with my email, especially like I, and I'm terrible at email. So that's a really good thing to, um, to, to coll collaborate on. Um, and so I would say, but I do some of it. That's probably like an hour a day. I'm, I'm doing that kind of thing. Um, but I would say now because the, you know, part of the reason I could take that risk to shift my style was because the podcast got to a place where I could turn down jobs. I could take on riskier opportunities, which I think books are kind of like, you know, uh, um, venture capitalist will invest in 10 companies and they only need mm -hmm. one to win. I think right. books, kinda like yeah, that. books are totally that way. Yeah. So you, so for me, shifting to books is really a risky thing. It's just like, I don't know if any of the, I don't know which of these will hit in any way. Uh, but the 2019 has been mostly me being very selective about projects. I'm working on several books. Some of them are in contract and we're actually in the middle of it. And then also, um, still working on the, 
the pitch phase of other books. And then I'm doing talks and workshops and I'm doing the podcast and I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of time spent, you know, when I do a post on Instagram now that it took me a long time. Like I, and I thought about it a lot and I made that artwork for Instagram to work on Instagram for a very particular purpose with real, you know, concepts, ideas, writing, all that, all that good stuff. And so the majority of my time this year has been spent taking risks and doing self-authored stuff. Super cool. Um, and you're publishing creative pep talk weekly. Week. Yeah. Every Tuesday, I probably do 49 episodes in a year, something like that. So we miss a few weeks, maybe, maybe a little bit less, maybe, maybe 48. I know it's important. <laughs> exactly. 47 and a half. I don't 47? know. 47. Yeah. Whatever, whatever uh -huh. it takes. 40, it might be 46 actually. Wait, <laughs> sorry. It could be 45. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I, that's one of my obsessions. I like that uh, type of, I, I def, it's like anti comedy. It's not funny. It's just awkward. It's just <laughs> weird but i do it on the podcast all the time if i start list like you know you get three or four things on there maybe five maybe six maybe seven of them <laughs> i can't I can't, stop. <laughs> can't stop can't stop um at, so out of all those vehicles that you're talking about instagram and the podcast itself or speaking uh your your agent um what do you feel like has been the strongest if if you had to pick just one source for self-promotion what do you think has been kind of the, the strongest for you in the last year? In the last year. Yeah. So before the last year, I would say it were personal projects uh, that were also content marketing. Uh, and, you know, they're basically the same thing. I'm sure tons of people just cringe their face off, but guess what? I don't care. That's what I'm a bad <laughs> marketer like that. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah. So before, and, and side projects that work, still believe in it. You need, you need to be doing that self-initiated stuff, not even just for marketing, but for a million other reasons. But, uh, you know, I think if you have your ear to the ground in the marketing world, you know that the hot new stuff is uh, influencer marketing. And I take that really seriously. I think about it. Uh, in this, there was a big breakthrough for me. Like early on, I was working with a content marketing company doing illustration for them back in like 2011. And I, I learned so many things about content marketing because they would put all this information out about best practices and all that stuff. And somehow the, it, I realized, oh, the things that, um, you know, my heroes were doing in illustration, these side projects, they were content marketing, whether they knew it was or not. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. So I, you know, I kind of systematized how I think best practices of tr making strategic personal projects and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in the same way that content marketing is uh, synonymous with certain types of strategic side projects, I see uh, collaborations as the artist equivalent of influencer marketing. And so I have kind of, you know, I like, I love collaborating and I've been more collaborative in my work in the past year than I ever have been. But that, that does have a little bit to do. I'm about to do an episode actually um, next week. I'm going deep into this about all the different ways you can tactically use the tactics from uh, uh, influencer marketing as an artist in your collaborations. But uh, that really didn't, although that's part of what made me dive deeper into collaboration, mm -hmm. the true catalyst for collaboration was the Lego Batman movie where... <laughs> He's like a loner and does everything alone and doesn't want any friends and all that. And I re I watched that movie in the theaters with my kids and I was like, that's basically my art practice. Like I don't collaborate with people and I don't, and it's too, you know, I think early on I did some collaborations and like a lot of them were really good, but some of them were, there was just a lot of complicated relational things that you have to work out. Right. And so I think I, it made me kind of just be like, I'm just going to do everything by myself because I can't, can't take it. And for the past year, I've kind of really shifted on that to be, to double down on collaborations. And if you're collaborating with people that are genuinely a lot better at certain things than you, there is, it's so magical 
Like I work with this guy, Connor Jones, uh, on my videos, my YouTube videos. He does all the graphics and, and edits my videos. I just shoot these videos. I send them to him. He turns them into a YouTube video. That's the most fun I've ever had. I, it is so amazing to do my weird thing, which is coming up with these ideas and being a weirdo on camera and then give it to him and he turns it into a product and does all these other, you know, he edits it in such a way where he's writing too, you know, like, uh, and the product or the same goes with my agent. Like I, I have this strategy of this big idea. I, I tell him the way that I've been doing it. Um, like, you know, notes on my phone and this big list and he turns it into this spreadsheet with colors and like moving uh, formulas. And I'm like, what's happening? Like, and we're so, <laughs> like, it's so much better. And so, yeah, I would say collaboration both as a marketing thing and as a, I'm just ready for that in as creative um, in, in the season that I'm in, but highly recommend go, you know, I don't care if you like Gary Vaynerchuk, you don't have to like him. He, he's a strong personality. I get that, but he knows marketing. He knows he's really good at it. He knows a lot about tactical stuff on when with influencer marketing. Tons of stuff you can learn about um, that that as a tool. Uh, and I and I encourage you not to chafe at the term influencer because it's a new word. I actually have a theory, and I'm going to shut up because I know we've been going for ages. You might have another question, but I kind of think influencer is our term for philosopher. Mm -hmm. Very controversial, and I know you. Am I saying that? Uh, Kim Kardashian is a philosopher. Yes, I am saying that. I'm not saying whether she's a good one or a bad one, but she is one of the top people introducing concepts into our culture and influencing what, how we think about life. She's hard to keep up with. She is hard. I mean, it's hard to keep up with those Kardashians. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I see what you're doing. I'm picking up on what you're laying down. Oh, more dead humor. That's good. Um, I think we're going to have to do a part two because I think I'm literally like halfway through the questions here and, and we are just like, this is question five, I think. And we are just barely scratching the surface. I'm so sorry. I feel so, like every podcast interview ends with me apologizing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so there, there are so many more in, in actuality, there are so many more things I want to ask you, but, um, I think we should land the plane soon. Okay. Um, and, and as we start to make our approach here, um, my favorite question to ask everyone is, yeah. what is the one thing that you think that you are most obsessed with right now? I love that question. But, that, but I love it so much that I can't answer it without really thinking about it. Think because I I am very addicted. To, like one of the things I don't think a lot of people know about ADHD is boredom is their kryptonite, and that mm -hmm. is really true. Like you know the executive function in their brain doesn't work very well. So and I've read in articles like a way of explaining that is like the dad in your brain doesn't win very many arguments. The kid wins. You're like well, I want to do that. Um, and so what excites me is always on the top of the list. Uh, you know what excites me the most is storytelling. So I, you know, I, I employ a lot of uh, storytelling techniques. I don't know how well I do it, but I employ a lot in my uh, illustration, in my podcast and in my talks. I think about it a lot. I love twists. I love foreshadowing. I love, you know, a, an ending that's surprising, but inevitable. That's like a storytelling thing. Uh, I am obsessed. I read, I was researching Dan Harmon's take on the hero's journey, which he's the Rick and Morty guy, community guy. And he has this thing called uh, his, his writing circle. And uh, it's just a take on Christopher Vogler's uh, story structure. And then before that was Joseph Campbell. And I'm very, and, there, and I was reading an article, I can't remember what it is, but you could probably find it pretty easily if you look up Dan Harmon's writing circle. Uh, and they talk about how there's only, there's only two things in the universe. There's math and there's story. And I think my brain is the story side. I don't get math. It's not my thing. But math is like a, our story is like a weird, uh, it's a formula. And, um, and creativity is, and storytelling is like, you go into the ring you know the basic things that you're supposed to do you know, in boxing. You know the, all the moves. You know the tricks. You train for it. You can be 
the more you understand the structure and the formula and the way the story works, the more powerful you are in the ring. But every, you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Michael Jordan. He, I, he's not a boxer, but <laughs> we'll mix metaphors here. Uh, <laughs> but that you can't, it's just like sports. It doesn't matter if you're the best. The best doesn't always win, right? So I love that the, com- the competitive and mystical and the, and the magical mixed with the science of storytelling of like, you can always get better, but some stories aren't going to work out. And I, and I love that stories are uh, mirroring the, the neurochemistry of our brain. It's how our brain works. And I love the, I love my favorite, favorite thing is feeling emotion. And I love that stories are just this crazy manipulative tool to make people feel meaning. And I love that there's, it's just, a, it's magic to me. So that, that's what I'm obsessed with right now. Love it. That's a fantastic answer. Nice. Um, so definitely let's sign us up for, for episode Absolutely. number two so we can continue. Great questions. Um, in the meantime, tell us where all of our listeners can uh, connect with you online, track down, create a pep talk, the books, the. Sure. So uh, I'm at Andy J pizza on Twitter and Instagram. Those are my main hubs. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. That's my favorite place to play online. And uh, you can find creative pep talk on all the podcast distributors, but I, I really like Apple. I like Apple podcasts and they're coming out with a new app. So keep stay tuned on there. Um, but it's on Spotify and all over the place. Search creative pep talk. It'll come up. Awesome. Well, Dr. Pizza, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. I hope so. I Quite know. possibly the most fun you can have on the microphone. I have a, I love doing this. This was so fun. And your questions made it so easy. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all, all these people who are listening. And uh, I can't wait to do round two. Well, thank you. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that is show number 124, officially in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. As we expand our topics here at Obsessed Show, please tweet at Obsessed Show and let me know who else you think we should talk to. And for those of you who are still listening, you are the obsessed of the obsessed. And if you'd like to support what's going on here at Obsessed Show, I would love it if you would check out patreon.com slash Josh Miles and see if you'd like to kick in a few bucks an episode. It would mean a ton to me. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. You can get all of today's show notes on our website, still at obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show developed a healthy appetite for the occasional slice of pizza at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Visit milesherndon.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.